If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this special edition of Mind Pump. Pop. We, we got Adam's mom in the house. Yeah, Mama right. Schaefer's here. I call her Mama Schaefer for only a few, she few more months. this episode. She right. said it was really yeah. tough the whole time to not chime in. I can see where you get your <laughs> your your mouth. My I aches to my mouth. mouth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, her she mouth looks, was quivering. She looks just, way too young to be your mom, by the way. It's yeah, true. Yes. You're, you're Stop baby. flirting with her. No, she, she's engaged. It's a, oh, oh, really? Sorry. So for the first 51 minutes, we do our introductory conversation. We start off by actually mentioning... The delicious super berry flavor of Brew Doctor. Oh, man. Uh, by the way, they're 100% raw, organic, non GMO, gluten free, vegan. Uh, it's a probiotic beverage. You can find them at Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, New Seasons, Kroger's, Sprouts, and most co- Costco's. And most Costco's? Most Costco's. Most, most Costco's. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a little bit of a Freudian <laughs> Hey, oops. What the hell? It tastes really good, though. I don't uh, know we talk about Adam's. always coming out of his mouth. <laughs> we talk about Ad- <laughs> it's better than going in your mouth, Adam. <laughs> hey. Then we talked about. Adam's Organifi Turmeric Blender Bleaching Update. I call bullshit. It's not uh, working. The sun is not taking out this. That's some strong Come turmeric. on, guys. We're looking at you for answers. Dude, I'm telling you. It could be Organifi, though. It's, it's on another level. That shit's real, man. Right. The, infl- the anti-inflammatory. Maybe that works for all the fake turmeric that's out there, but Organifi's Ooh, got the real that's strong. That's got the real staining kind. We are yeah. sponsored by Organifi. If you go to Organifi.com forward slash Mind Pump and enter the code Mind Pump, you get 20% off. Then we talked about some pranks, like the time somebody pooped in Justin's car. <laughs> that asshole. I still I, remember. I feel like Justin did that and then tried to blame it on somebody. <laughs> you know what I mean? He no, make man. It. I didn't take it to that level. He couldn't make it Seems home. like an angry, angry I threw a dead animal in his, <laughs> yeah. in his room because uh, of it. We talked about the Audi chief executive being arrested for diesel gate. We talked uh, about your feet. Shenanigans. And your health. Multiple personality disorder and the power of the mind. Then yeah. we get into the questions. Uh, first question was, you know... As a trainer, it can be tough to practice what you preach. What are some tips uh, that we have to hold yourself accountable, to keep you accountable for what you teach? Great segment in this episode. Yeah. The next question was, uh, we talked about increasing calories to rev up your metabolism, but a lot of people don't want to eat more because they're afraid of gaining body fat. What can we tell our clients or what can we tell ourselves when going through that Don't process. Don't be afraid of the gains. The next question was, this particular individual's mom is 60 years old and has osteopenia and started lifting weights, but their doctor or their nurse told them not to lift weights. For some reason, they're idiots. Mm. Uh, we need to talk about this. We actually mentioned Primer and Prime Pro in this segment of that episode. You can find those programs at mindpumpmedia.com. And the final question, is it beneficial to implement cuts or mini cuts into a bulk. So let's say you're trying to gain muscle mass and you're eating more calories. Is it smart to have a day or two or a week where you actually cut your calories? Can that actually help you build muscle? It's actually going to shock you, that segment Mm. of this episode. Also, this month, Maps Anywhere is half off all month long. 50% off. Maps Anywhere is our program that utilizes almost no equipment. All you need are bands. You literally do it anywhere. And a stick. We also have bundles of MAPS programs where we take multiple MAPS programs, put them together, and we discount like 30% off. For example, the Super Bundle is a year of exercise programming. So if you want your next year planned out for you with expert exercise programming, get the Super Bundle. It is your best value. You can find all those programs, including 50% off MAPS anywhere at mindpumpmedia.com. Get some. So Adam, I want to ask you about the uh, the first time you had sex. Let's talk about <laughs> Dude, you would you would you would go there you would go there right away with my mom sitting in the house or what? sitting in the studio. Right he's, got, now. he's got his mom in the studio. We want right all now. the details, dude. You couldn't yeah. even warm up. You go right for the yeah, no, jugular no, no, right no, away. I'm just kidding. So uh, I'm only joking. Mama Schaefer is in the the studio today. So if I'm a little PC, that <laughs> that might be why. This is the. This is the most nervous I've been in 800, Are you really? 800 he's, episodes. He's sweating a little. I've never you? been so nervous to do our show, except for my mom's show. I feel like I'm going to get like the daggers every time I tell, <laughs> tell, tell a story She's going to smack you, she yeah, said. Yeah, 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 this is excellent. No, I Find love out it. real quick why I'm afraid of them La- Latino women, dude. Oh, they, yeah. they get that, cra- that crazy streak in them if they want to. A frying pan you know, put coming you, your way. Put yeah. you in your place, you know? Man, this... Um, 
This kombucha. Which flavor is this that Taylor brought us? This oh, is the this new is, flavor. Dude, this is the berry one. This is the one with the elderberry. I like this one better than the, oh, the apple so cider. So tasty. Yeah. It's called Super Berry. Right. I like it because it's uh, it tastes good um, organic. Do you know that Taylor's working on us uh, getting a keg here? Oh, I a can't keg wait. of Brew Doctor. So yeah. by the end of this week, I believe. Did you know that, Doug? Did you know that was coming? He mentioned it. So yeah, it's supposed to be coming by the end of this week, and we're going to run two taps on the the kegerator. Is that what it's called? Is it kegerator? Is that the right? How do you say? I think it? That, sounds, sounds good. I feel like that was. One. I think that was Doug's nickname in college. Kegerator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> called the keg- in college now. He's the hey, kegerator. how about how about when we did the memes in Santa Cruz, uh, or when we were just up at the what you call it? Uh, not Santa Cruz, Pajaro Dunes. Oh yeah. When we were messing with each other and doing all oh, the, with the shiv. Doug's was the best, yeah. but you had <laughs> you had to be like a true listener since day one to really get it because people were DMing me like yeah because his had a picture of. Was an ice pick. Is it, well, Doug first, a psychopath? Well, first it was a picture of like a like an Asian schoolgirl. Yeah, and that's just because he lived in Japan for a long time, oh, so we yeah, tease him yeah, about yeah, that yeah. all the time. Not 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 his Asian, you know, fetish or anything. No, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, nothing, yeah. About, nothing, nothing like to do that. with that. Yeah, yeah. there's no, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. nothing yeah. about the what was it the what was what are those machines called the uh, the panty the, yeah uh, the panty machines right. inside oh, the, the vending machines yeah. yes in Japan it's a real thing they I actually, actually never saw one though oh you never saw never one. saw one no but you wanted I to invest so hard yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> what what a great investment opportunity what, hey how do you Google that. Uh, what do well, you what do you Google? You can dirty Google. women's underwear. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I don't know. I think that'll show up on your history forever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a business guy. Thing. So he had that. Then he had a shiv, which looked like an ice pick. But people don't know that. There's a joke about that. It's because Doug is easily the most dangerous member of the Mind Pump crew. Right. For yeah. sure. He's the first guy to make a shiv. He's gonna. He's gonna. Yeah. He'll kill people. We'll so stab you. We keep him happy. We try yeah. to at least. What was the other? So there was the. There the, was those two. Then there was what else was on that meme? Uh, oh, the the, the the kombucha. Oh, yeah, yeah because he brews kombucha yeah, and, right. and then podcasting equipment. Yeah. That's yeah. right, yeah. Yours was ruthless, Adam. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, no, the second one? I thought Justin's was oh, the best. The Rogaine. Yeah, yeah. mine was <laughs> cheese and a plunger. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't get any more accurate than that, I guess. Justin. Yeah. <laughs> Except if you would have had, like, painted toilets. Like, I was hoping for that. If you're going to go in, go in. I just, how do you find that? You know what I mean? Uh, how do you find painted toilets? Know, like yeah, like the right way, too. Dude, I'm seriously tripping over the taste of this kombucha. This has to be the best one that I've had. Yeah. Don't they have? They had an apple one that so liked a lot too. They also, I think, I, I believe he was telling me they're making it in cans. Yes. So you can take it with you to the beach and, you know, and like, because, you know, some of these beaches, they don't allow like the, the bottles to um, go down there. Just I don't like think any beach does, do they? Yeah, I don't think so. I think that's a pretty universal thing. You can't have glass some on the beaches. beach. Beaches. Yeah, so kombucha. now you can have some kombucha while you're enjoying the sun yeah, in the summer. Huh? Yeah, a lot of people don't realize. I mean, uh, it, I have to say this: kombucha is a it's a fermented tea drink. Mm-hmm. So if you're trying to get more fermented foods in your diet because of the you know the beneficial bacteria, you know we humans have eaten fermented foods for thousands of years. It's present in almost every ancient culture, and it's probably an important part of overall health. And so it's just an easy way to do it nowadays. Otherwise, where else do you get fermented food, right? Yogurt, but then you know, if you get yogurt, you're probably getting a yeah. bunch of crap. Right. Like bunch the of real sugar. Yeah, real yogurt isn't like sweet sauerkraut and, and it's Yeah, like, sauerkraut. How many things you can put sauerkraut on? Ugh. Yeah, no, no, I don't know too many people eat a lot of sauerkraut. Yeah. Kombucha is cool cuz you just buy it and drink it and uh, if you have problems pooping, Justin. Now when you had help. now when you had Dr. Ruscio It's not a problem. I'm just gonna put it out there. It's, <laughs> it's when you had Dr. Efficient. Ruscio on the show, didn't you didn't you guys go on the YouTube and talk a little bit about Booch? Did you guys talk about it? Uh, we just talked about the benefits of, of fermented foods, and he did mention how kombucha is a because I thought one. I asked him I thought I asked him what how much he recommended that you drink it. Do you remember? No, I am assuming that the answer is going to be it depends. Of I, course, I, I don't think consuming anything too much is going to be beneficial. I know for me, if I have a bottle of kombucha every few days, every two days or so, it seems to be the right yeah. amount. If I have like one a day or two a day, then I actually will start to bother. You know what me. I don't get from this? You know how some of them they have like a really thick film across. It's like the slime. Oh yeah, you know parts of the scoby. Yeah, parts is of the scoby. Is yeah. it called scoby? Yeah, well, this is nice and smooth. It doesn't yeah, have that. little that's... scoby starts to develop in a lot of these bottles of kombucha. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't notice that in this one, which is great. No, it's, a, it's the, they use a scoby to make it, but then there's no scoby in the. It's also one of the lowest in sugar too, right? Yeah, yep. Mm. You know they have to use sugar because that's what ferments. That's what the bacteria feeds off of. So it's impossible. Yeah, so to eat. It's impossible to do. Of course, that. it's just like any alcohol. Like you yeah. know what I mean? Alcohol is it's made by fermenting sugar. 
Mm. Mm-hmm. Science. Learn something, yeah. science. <laughs> There's something new every science. single day. Sci- hey, I want to ask you, dude, what? about your uh, the you had five people message you saying if you put your turmeric stained blender in the sun, All right. how it would bleach out the or Have get rid of the turmeric. Experimented with this yet? Did I, that work? We just did it. It didn't work. It didn't oh, work. Oh no! So I don't know if Organifi has just got like super turmeric, <laughs> and so it stains the shit out of the blender to where I, there's no way for me to clean this out. But we just did it yesterday, and I told Katrina, "Well, did you make sure it was like directly in the sunlight, or did it get shaded?" And so we went through like the whole checklist. So it's there again today. So I'm mm. not. I haven't fully abandoned this strategy because everybody says that supposedly. I mean, I must have got ten DMs by today. Now they kept people coming. People still saying that. Yeah, everybody is telling me that if your blender gets stained with turmeric, you can put it out in the sun. The sun will naturally bleach it back to its normal color. Here's what I recommend: baking mm. soda or uh, lemon or white vinegar as a mild bleach. That's what I recommend. Wonder if I do all of the above. I wonder if I bleach vinegar that'll explode. I just don't feel good about putting bleach in my <laughs> yeah. blender. Why not? I don't know. Huh? I don't know. It just doesn't feel like I should do that. You never bleach you things that you taste eat. it. You never ble- you don't bleach your like your, your sponges that you I wash don't, your dishes I, on? I don't I don't bleach oh, that's why you don't wash dishes. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what is that? <laughs> Whatever, dude. Yeah. You've been, you were single for like six months, bro. You know uh, you know what dishes were like for like huh? six months. That's I still it. wash dishes. Do you? Yeah, I do. I do the dishes. You didn't just uh-huh. do that for Instagram? No, we do a trade, me and Jessica. <laughs> we do a trade. Sexual favors Every for time dishes. he does it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's totally worth it. In an apron with a shirt off. You know uh-uh. I mean? Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Yep. That You know, I think of all the house duties- I do anything for sex. If, yeah. <laughs> I do, we know girl. that. We know that. All the house duties, dishes are my least favorite. D- dishes are the most meditative. I disagree. <sighs> Folding laundry is more meditative to me. Yeah. Uh, folding laundry is also yeah. Folding laundry dishes suck. You, let me tell you. It, it okay, I'm gonna suck. change your mind right now. Okay, here's why dishes are so close, meditative. Close me on why I want to do dishes. <laughs> okay, so folding anything. <laughs> Katrina's you, gonna love you. Anything you do that requires like low skill can be meditative because you can get into a rhythm, and you can get into your zone and become very present and think and just what or just be present. The water and washing dishes is what helps do that. The feeling of the water on your hands can. Because it's a sensation can help make you more present. Put headphones on and listen to music while you do it as well. Yeah, I've, give I've, that a shot. Be, be zen about it, bro. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you yeah. do your? You don't do your dishes. I do. Yeah. I oh, see. you do too. Yeah, but like, way to make me feel like a no, 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 not all the time. Yeah. So calm down. You know, yeah. like I, we're I, definitely better guys. I yours. tried. Like <laughs> honestly, I have to like try to to make sure. Like I'm like, oh shit, I gotta do that. Like something to help out. You know, like I. So I used to, she would, she would just want me to do the floors because her thing is like, if the floors are dirty and like any kind of like uh, dirt comes in from outside, she freaks out. So for me, it's like the countertops, like I, I can't stand like chaotic, you know, clutter everywhere. So I'm always like, that's my thing. Like I want to get rid of that yeah. shit. So the dishes is a lot uh, like an afterthought to me. So I'm always like checking myself like, oh fuck, I should probably So you have to, you have to do a lot of stuff in the house because I'll tell you why. First off. All of our girls work, so it's like they work too, right? Mm-hmm. So we don't, we can't really say, "Hey, I work." You don't, you can't say that. Number two, when's the last time a burglar came in? You had to defend everybody. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we're worthless. So you got to clean, <laughs> is, or you can well, have. No, there's a guy that came in the house next door, and I went and you know checked it well, out. So you don't have to do shit then. You should tell your wife, like, I don't have to do yeah. anything for at least. Yeah, six I months. did that exactly for the year because I defended the. I did. The, what the is house. your least? Sure what is your least favorite house chore around the house to do or not do? Hmm. God, what's my least favorite? Uh, dishes are mine, man. I don't yes, like dishes. Dishes are bad. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I don't like dishes. I don't mind dishes. I don't mind cleaning the floors, making beds. Not that big of a deal. Probably cleaning bathrooms, like toilets and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Do you even do that? Nope. You no, don't? No, we hire somebody yeah, yeah. for that. Yeah, you have you have house cleaners, don't you? I, I, bring, yeah. I have someone who comes. I know. I week. finally do. I know. You just now got yeah, into this yeah, world. Yeah, I just got into this world the last couple of months since been oh, a game changer. That? Yeah, how's that been? Oh, so nice to come in and it's like the smells scent. good. Yeah, and everything is like <laughs> smells like chemicals. So pretty. Yeah. So how yeah. many how many months in are you right now? Uh, probably four. I want to say four. Oh, months. so you're still in the honeymoon phase yeah, of house cleaners. I know. Cleaners. Yeah, so see, what, that's what everybody says. It's like they you know come in, they try real hard to win your business, and they do everything awesome, and then they start slacking on you. They should start to get missing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got to start hiding your money. Yeah. <laughs> did you guys hire somebody you knew, or did you? Was it a recommendation just from it was, somebody? A, it was a recommendation <laughs> from one of Courtney's Dude, friends. I had a friend. I had this friend that used to work work out of my gym. Right, this woman. And she hired this lady to clean her house. 
And this woman was extremely thorough. So the so she said she she took pictures. She came home one day, and her her sex toys were lined up on her drawer. Oh wow! All yeah, like standing up, all like she's like she cleaned, she cleaned everything the sex and toys. stood. Yeah, that's did I ever? T- <laughs> that's that's like really you know going the extra step. Did I ever tell you guys the the Astro Glide prank that I played on my boy? No. Oh. Dude, so I'll never forget that. I thought I shared this story. <laughs> Astro on my Glide book. prank on yeah. your boy. Yeah. All right. Well, well yeah, I'm we proud always... of you for for bringing this story in with your mom right now. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. it, it's okay. It's not that bad. For okay. Her. All right. So we it, this was uh, so. I remember I told you guys this before that every year we used to go up to Trinity for like ten days. We go camping, and everything, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so this year, my buddy Mark, you guys know Mark. Yeah, we yeah. talked about Mark before. Uh, he, it, this is the, the friends that I go camping with. These are like childhood friends. And so I was bringing him to this camping trip for the first time mm-hmm. and kind of introducing him to those friends, whatever. And he had to go back home early. Well, when he went back home two days earlier than when we left the campsite, my wallet was in his car. And so he lived in Sacramento at the time and we had to come down through Sacramento and I'm pulling the boat. So I have my, back then I had my lifted Chevy. I'm pulling the boat and Mark lives downtown Sacramento and he's got my wallet. And I'm driving in and I'm I'm asking him, I'm like, hey, could you meet me like at a freeway exit or something like that so I could just pull off and get it from you? And he's like, oh no, we gotta go to this party. It'll I'll leave my doors unlocked in the back, just come and get it. And I'm like, bro, I've got the bow and he's downtown. So I I've been to his house a bunch of times, so I know it's gonna be a pain in the ass. Oh, I know it's gonna be a real pain in the ass just to get in and out of there. And he's like, Oh no, we gotta go to this party and this and that. I'm like, dude, I'm only like 30 minutes away. Can you just wait? And he was like, nah, and he hung up the phone and he left me and he left the door. <laughs> so I was pissed, right? So I'm fucking hella mad, like heading into that. And we get we get to the we get to his house and he collects DVDs like I do. So I did a bunch of different pranks, right? So he's in it's Sacramento, it's July, so it's like 110 degrees. So I go, I crank his heater up to as high as it goes. Right? So I turn <laughs> I turn I turn his heaters on, right? I go hide all of his TV remotes. I, I take one shoe of all of his dress shoes. I hide. I'm so pissed about this whole wow. thing, dude, right? This you whole went all out. I did go all out because I was so mad. I took all of his DVDs. I took them all out, scattered them. Bro, and then, you spent time. Yeah, I did. I was, <laughs> you can see how mad I was. I was really mad. Like, like you put made them me, all in the wrong you sleeve. You made me pull a boat. Yes. Oh, wow. The wrong sleeve. on them. this. That that prank, by the way, ended up being the best prank of all of them because that lasted like five years. Of course. You pull out like, so, oh, I want to watch Commando. So he's just like going for the random, like, it's like random movie hour. Like, you just never know. So what ended up happening he told me this years later he says because he was so angry about all of this stuff it took, it took <laughs> us a while before we could laugh about it you know it was like a year later before we could joke about it and stuff and he goes that dvd thing you did to me screwed me for literally for years because it got to the point where it's like he'd want to watch a movie and he has like 500 dvds yeah so to you want specifically that movie and then you have no idea which one it could possibly be in he says i, I would spend a half hour trying to find it and then finally <laughs> just said forget it i'll just watch whatever's in this case <laughs> that one really pissed. Him. That one really pissed. Turner him off. and Hooch again. You but, know? <laughs> oh my god! The last prank that I got on him that it didn't it didn't come around until probably about a month later. I guess until he used his Astroglide. But we took the Astroglide and we dumped it out and we put water back in it instead of oh. Ast- Astroglide. Oh, that's so, a mood killer. Yeah. That's- <laughs> 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 this is working right. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's cold. Yeah. So that was my that's my Astroglide prank. Dude. I got a buddy. I got a buddy that switched out the Vaseline with or mixed in some uh, what's it called? Uh, oh no! Uh, Icy hot. Yes. Stuff. No, Vicks. Vicks vapor rub. That's. Oh. Yeah, I won't oh. go into the deep story about that. Oh. Oh. Let's, oh, that's let's not, just say that's wrong. you reach for the Vaseline and you end up with some uh, you know some mentholated. Yeah. You know? Oh my god. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Icy hot would have been just death. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Would have, yeah. That has been. I super feel like wrong. a good a good prank is a prank that gets somebody and it continues to get somebody for a long time and it doesn't destroy yeah. anything. Like they, they, they like can see they, they give up and they're like, oh, yeah. okay, this is how yeah. things are going to be for a while. Right. Yeah. Like I think th- th- those are great pranks. <laughs> I like that. pranks, but the problem with them is that they start to they they progress and they start to get worse. And I'm the kind of person like right. I don't do pranks on people because I don't like being pranked myself. So I'm like I'm and I'm cool like I'm I'm pretty cool with that kind of stuff. Well, but you got to be prepared for the backlash. That's it, and yeah. I know that I'll I'll amp it up, and then they're going to amp it up, and we'll amp it up, and well, then before and, you know it, you know, well, it's no, going to be like I shaved goes. your head while you're sleeping. Well, yeah, and what normally happens is somebody destroys something or breaks, yeah. it, like takes it yeah. to a level where it's or like it takes oh. a dump in your car. It's like, yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah, that, yeah. that happened to me. What yes. in your car? Yes. Somebody yes. shit in your car in the car because there was like a <laughs> there was like a what did you do to deserve that? Nothing. I peed on this guy's. 
tires. Like I was like, <laughs> oh, like I got back from the bars drunk. I thought it'd be hilarious to like you know we we're yeah, peeing we we're peeing like you know on, on on the grass like in front of the dorms, and uh, so I'm peeing on this guy's tire. as my friend. And I was like ha ha ha. You know it was like a totally piece of crap car, right? And uh, so <laughs> he apparently saw me through the the window that night, and then the next morning I found like a, a turd in my my front seat. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> how did he get in yeah, there? How did he get in there, uh, dude? He he took a a, a hover dump like over oh, the sunroof. Sunroof. <laughs> <laughs> that, but like I, that took a lot of effort, you know what I mean? And and I, oh so, wow, yeah, that was. Could you imagine? I couldn't get, talk to him for you, a while. You imagine that, getting yeah. caught doing that prank by the yeah, cops trying to explain right. that? What, what are you doing? No, 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 it's a joke. It's just a joke, <laughs> dude. How mad? I was like that you? escalated quickly. It was yeah, a, it I was, was a, so mad. Dude. It was a good, healthy oh. one though, huh? Fully formed. It was yeah. It was a nice pile. Yeah. What, oh yeah. god, that's t- in your car? In What'd you do? Car. Sell your car? Yeah, I just got rid of it. Dude. Just, I mean, just left it there. I'm done with this car, dude. Just abandon your car. It, it was, was a piece tell, of shit. Anyway. I was gonna say, tell me you were driving a bomb. No, or no, no. It was a Tercel. It was like a little piece of shit. I ended up buying a Jeep after that. Because, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is terrible. I, I didn't care too much. It, but like, it, dude, his car was the same. It was like a piece of shit. And we even like, we took um, spray paint and we like painted flames on it and made it all ironically like horrible, you know, and, like it was a race car and stuff. And then he goes and did that. That was dirty. I saw an upper decker, a real upper decker. I didn't even know people actually did that in real life. Now, is that wow. when you is that when you shit in the sink or when you shit no, in you the shit upper in the part, the, part where no, you no, flush? No, 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 no. You poop in the tank. Yes. Because people don't know that it's there, and they could have flushed the toilet, and shit water yeah. fills up your toilet, and you can't figure it out. Oh and the God. only way to get it out is you have to go in and clean the tank by hand. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you keep flushing it. And it That's makes disgusting. Its, it's horrible. Yeah, dude. it's called an upper decker. <laughs> it's terrible. I don't think girls prank each other like that. <laughs> no, I, I don't. don't think so. I don't think girls do that. No, they don't do sh- terrible, terrible things. I had another buddy who yeah. <laughs> who passed out, and so they shaved his eyebrows. I thought that would be hilarious. Wow. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> that is hilarious. It is funny. It's you know why it's funny? Because it took it took my buddy like an alien for like months. You know, <laughs> yeah. like you can't help it. it doesn't grow very fast Bro, at all. Yeah. It took yeah, it's it took fucked up. it took my buddy like twenty minutes to figure out what was wrong with his reflection. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking in the mirror. He keeps, what the fuck is wrong with my? <laughs> I can't figure. It. He, so imagine you wake up with no, oh. no eyebrows. Like, uh, yeah, you might not notice that uh, first. Uh, like, why do I look weird? So what's the move? You just gotta draw it on, like a, like. No, know, like he a, just no eyebrow. He just looks surprised all the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, it's terrible. Uh, yeah, those are the, those uh, are the uh, kinds of pranks. Funny that, one. Hey, you know, it was about prank. it was about a month or two ago that we talked. We got into the first time I think we started talking about sports. We brought up the the movie Moneyball. Did you ever get a chance to go watch that, Sal? Yeah. Which one? Moneyball. <laughs> no, no, I, don't I really it. want you to 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 watch it because this story uh, would have. I'm s- probably the worst person to tell to do something. I don't know what it is. I just uh, yeah, I know. If I, I don't, I, if I, t- I try yeah. to trick you most of the time. No, so, what hey, you got to do is throw like a magazine or like some like article out on the table, and then some. Oh, I saw this article. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I like, know. I totally planted <laughs> it there. <laughs> just invite me over and play it, and then I'll watch it. You know what yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. So what's going on is the guy that whole movie is about is Billy Bean. Billy Bean is famous in the sports world, especially in the baseball world, because he was the beginning of this new era of really breaking down the uh, the analytics of players that mm-hmm. were coming in. For example, mm-hmm. he, figure, he figured out like, okay, with a smaller budget, we would go buy players that nobody knows who they are. But if I break down like mathematically how often this guy gets on base, I could put him in this role. Or I break down how often this guy hits home runs. All analytic based. Yes. And all- he would get rid of players that were peaking and they're most valuable so he could actually then now reinvest into the team. And right. so he would like it was it's kind of ruthless, but it's very mathematical and it's very logical. It sounds like a business. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. It's it absolutely brilliant. He's been killing it, it with it's, it, except it's, for winning it's, uh, World Series. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. For as if you look at a as a, a a franchise as a business model, it's mostly owners and people that are dealing with the money do. Uh, the athletics are one of the most profitable teams in sports and have been since he's arrived. Mm-hmm. Now, because of that, they locked him up for years. Like he's an athletic guy. His contract is up in one year. Oh, wow. Because he, he, he flirted for a minute for going to um, the Boston Red Sox, right? right and they, then they ended up adopting his system and winning 
That's game and that's when they series. locked. They ended up locking him up for yeah. I mean ten or fifteen years. I don't remember how long yeah. the contract was, and that contract is up in a year. So the oh, reason wow. why I'm bringing this up right now is when you have big time people like that, they normally sign their new contract well before a year. So because it's hit the one year mark and there's been no conversation on it, now the big rumor all is that he's gone for sure. And so the Where question is going right. So the, in sports right now, this is like a big deal. It's a really big deal. Because this guy, how much is, do these guys typically get paid? Are they hype? Are they paid as much as players? Oh no, they're not paid as much as a superstar player. But he makes good money now. Billy Bean also negotiated part of the A's, so he has part ownership of them in his contract. So he makes a lot of money, which means they're going to have to. How's he going? How's that going to work if it, he works yeah. for another team? They'll have to buy him out. They have to, right? They have to, yeah, because yeah, it would be conflict of interest exactly. for him to go for another team and yeah. be, be be doing that. Yeah, and like, how do they work that out as far as evaluating the worth, you know, and like, because they'd have to like project it out, like at least what ten years or something. Well, like the the, worth. the rumor is that I mean, he's he's so sought after that he could pretty much get a job anywhere and name his prize for his position. So he'll get the top dollar for whatever is getting paid for his position mm -hmm. for any team because. He's been handcuffed this entire team. They have only a lot, like there's the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Giants, like all your big name teams, like they spend money. Like they, mm -hmm. they'll go out and buy a big player if they feel like, even though they, they still are, they use analytics, but they still will go buy big names. Well, he, I speculate that he would probably want to go to a team that's like, hasn't, like has been shitty, just like if, so he can show him. So he can show, yeah, yeah, he can show his system. Like it has been proved. If I was Billy Bean and I wanted to like go somewhere else, I would want to go somewhere where it was like that substantial. That makes sense because then you're really building a legacy. Well, yeah. the, he's kind of built one already. He's already famous. He has. Yeah, he's yeah. already. He's but I mean, imagine if he did it again. Yeah, I don't think I. I think that's just a lot of work. I, I mean, I don't know the guy personally, yeah, so we're know. obviously we're we're totally speculating. But I don't think that he cares. I think what would get him more is actually staying in the Bay Area. You know, like mm. the, so the rumor is that there, there's a chance he go to the Giants, right? So damn it, like you know, they need any help? Yeah, yeah they, they, that's what's exciting. They've, they've is been that, killing it, already. right? Right, that a team like the Giants will pick him up with you know with the already the pieces that we have in place, and so we might move in that direction. So I'm excited that that's a possibility that might happen, regardless if the Giants get him. Or not, it's big news in sports right now to see where this guy ends up landing because of what he was, what he's been able to do with one of the smallest. Well, doesn't the Giants budgets? Well, the Giants has got some superstars, right? But, the, but aren't they kind of known for playing like yeah, that? Yeah, we developed a lot of our players, so that's mm -hmm. they, they. So during the the uh, Bruce Bochy era, you know, who's known as like a players coach, they yeah, I know some stuff. They, <laughs> I think it's you hilarious. Totally yeah. Just, yeah. Red, yeah. Huh? Throw yeah. random yeah. stuff. I mean, Buster Posey, he was free. You know, they developed him. <laughs> Buster Posey, he's son of <laughs> a bitch. Throw that one out. Will <laughs> Clark, you know, he's <laughs> awesome. No, no, he doesn't play anymore. That's old. Though. Oh, <laughs> yeah. you, you caught me. That was I a test. You, you just got to know enough, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 just yeah, enough. You <laughs> yeah. the key is, though, to know just enough but then not get cocky and not to keep going. No, 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 no. Yeah, Like, yeah, you know when he scored that three-pointer? That was crazy. Oh, shit, we're talking baseball. He's made the most touchdowns. Yeah. Anyway, are you why are you your minor league team? The Mudcats? you look like you're tan, dude. You know what? I don't know where. Well, we were out this this last weekend for the graduation, oh, so okay. I was I was outside. I got like a farmer's tan going on uh -huh. right now. Yeah, uh -huh. not like a well, Justin yeah. over here who already lost his color. No, he uh, went. Well, he went gone. from he went back to white. Yeah, yeah, yeah he was at red. For he a went bit. he went red to like this. I, yeah. Light, lighter white to mm -hmm. back to white. I like his on hair. way to clear. I will say this, Justin. Your hair is amazing. It is. It's like a. Uh, it's almost all silver now. You know it's, what I mean? It's getting there. What was your natural hair color? It was like it was dark brown, but I mean, at one point it was like almost black. And really? Then, yeah. Well, I went. You would from, look terrible in black weird. hair. Hey, no, you look actually, good with I looked awesome in black hair. Did dude. you really? Yeah, <laughs> I looked awesome. Yeah, uh, I looked awesome. Thank you very dude, much. Yeah, whatever. Like you don't know anything. <laughs> no, no. Like, it, like that was when I used to do the pompadour thing, and I was like, I thought I was like all rockabilly. You know, like that you had was a little soul patch on your on your yeah, chin. Yeah, a little soul patch, and then greased my hair back. But yeah, I went through like a bunch of phases. My hair it was weird. Like when I when I was younger, it was blonde and it was straight, and so it looked like a mop. And I look like a total surfer kid. And then I went from that to this weird phase when, when I hit puberty where it was like it got curly and it was like light brown. And then after that, it got it got kind of straight and wavy and then it was darker. 
it's it's like this weird evolution, dude. I went through like all the different. Phases. How about the picture he posted and on now Instagram? Silver. Well, where he was uh... wearing the exact same outfit as he. <laughs> oh my god, that was junior high too. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'm but not... in your defense, though, and I've been I've been saying this for a while now. Like right now, the things that are becoming popular again. Like I remember doing all this in junior high and early years of high school. Mm-hmm. Like that, in some of these trends, I love like the tall socks. Like that's awesome. Like that was a that was yeah. a total fad. I'm just uh, happy because it's like I don't have it. to change. Full circle. Yeah, you, you're you know? starting to look back in style. Yeah, right it's now. like a broken clock. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh, here I, you go. I'm, I'm never, be on time I've again. never changed. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I proved it. But you know, the gray hair looks good, and it's you know, back in the day, men used to color their hair to look white and gray. Really? That, yeah, powdered well, wigs, dude. That was a big thing back uh, yeah. in the day because it made you look, you know, smart and distinguished and whatever. It was a big Wasn't thing that because of the syphilis or something. What? Yeah, what? it was some kind of, because of something like uh, where your hair fell out. I don't know what, what what it was. Some kind of STD. Look it up, Doug. I'm not. I'm not bullshitting. You. Really? Yes. Yeah, so that was like the the start of why they started wearing wigs, and then it became but it was, popular. Yeah, but it, but the white hair was a big thing. Like right. having white. Yeah, hair. but if it started because of syphilis, that's going to be hilarious. I've never I'm ever serious. Heard. Like yeah, yeah. Pull, pull that up. That's a yeah. random. Yeah. Fact. But bald, bald, and or gray hair. For in many ancient cultures, were sought after. It was, in fact, some cultures would shave the top of their head to look like they were bald on the top. And I think it was some, oh, yeah. yeah, Asian cultures would do that, where they would shave the top to make it look Probably like look like you're full of more wisdom. Right? It's you're because like, it's true, like bro. Older guy. It's I true, would totally shave my head bald. I've got a really nice round head, but I have psoriasis all over it now, so mm. it would look all weird. You would yeah. look like the alien, you have like continents. You, yeah, no, you'd look like, like the alien. Like Remember a globe. that globe? Yeah. What was that show? Uh, that that TV series where one dude was an alien. There were cops. Oh, one yeah. guy was an alien. One guy wasn't. And the alien people like drinking sour milk. Remember that? Yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> what's that, dude? So I... you'd look like that guy because remember their skin was kind of like yeah, it was yeah. like Mikhail Gorbachev <laughs> on his head everywhere. <laughs> so you, so you <laughs> look at Justin's right. Yeah. So yeah. It, uh, Syphilis by nineteen by fifteen eighty the STD had become the worst epidemic to strike Europe since the Black Plague. Wow! Boom. So uh, knowledge bombs. So they got open sores, nasty rashes, blindness, dementia, and, dementia, and patchy hair loss. God, you imagine that? Yeah. Because you because you were dirty. Yeah. You know what I mean? What a what a price to pay. Got to keep it in your pants. You know yeah. What, I mean? what yeah. a price to pay. Who knows though? But back then life was probably pretty tough. So you're like, fuck it. The, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll just wear a wig. Just roll the yeah. dice and see what happens. Dude, what were you saying about the Audi CEO? Yeah, so the Did you Audi hear about this? No. He he just got uh, popped for um, I guess being tied into you know that whole conspiracy or well not conspiracy that whole diesel they, thing they, they took down the diesel. Oh yeah the, yeah. Jail. Yeah, they manipulated the software. Yeah, so he's he's in jail. Jail. Because he's connected. He's tied in with that whole like shenanigan. Like he knew it was going on. They and it just now surfaced now. Yeah. No, I think they've been. I think this they've been, been investigating. Yeah. Him, yeah. So. Uh, since that dirty money thing, or yeah, is it? Yeah. Uh, okay. I think that probably, yeah, pro- put more pressure. I'm sure on the what's it, what's he looking at? Obviously, they haven't sentenced sentenced him yet. I'm I don't, sure I he's don't go- know, he's but going through jail though, huh? That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. How old though? Jail. I mean, this is this brings me back to my whole Bill Cosby theory. You know, some of these guys might give up, give up the rest. <laughs> <Just> say fuck <laughs> it. Yeah, no, I'm serious. Like, I, I mean, I know people now that are in their six, 60- seven years. Oh wow, seven years. Wow. There you go. You know, this Yikes. is what. Can I tell you what irritates me a little bit about this? Not that he's getting jail time. Well, that's the VW exec, the Audi one. Oh, the Audi um, one. Yeah, yeah. He 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 just recently got sentenced. Well, gets, wow, but even that was just December of 2017. Yeah, that was yeah. just not that long ago. You know, what makes me. You know, what makes me mad about that. Right is above that it, Doug, the top one's Audi. Barely yeah. anybody went to jail for that whole like you know the whole banking fiasco that we had in 2000. What was that? Oh, eight. Yeah. One of the biggest gangster moves. Yeah, ever. and instead they got money. They got taxpayer money. <laughs> that's what he <laughs> taste the shit out of me. Yeah. Still throwing those fuckers in jail too. Wow, this is crazy. Yeah, yeah they're all going down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you guys check out that the documentary, the Evil Genius one that I was telling you guys no, about? No, yes. you told me the Stairway, right? Yeah, the Stairway is the next one that I'm I'm going to be watching that next. Oh, you haven't seen it yet? You I haven't seen the Stairway one yet because it recommended that one after I watched the Evil Genius. I've heard one. nothing but good stuff about that one too. It's like a really like it has a lot of twists. Um, you know, like you think you know, like it's it's kind of like making a murderer. You yeah. don't really know at the end of the, at, at the end of the day, if, like, is he guilty? Is he not guilty? I mean, it could go either way. It's just fascinating to me how unique we all are as humans. How we have certain things that, like, you can be an absolute genius, but then you can have like no common sense. Yeah. Like, and there's intelligence and integrity 
it can be totally two separate things. Totally. Some of the people with the worst, in, in fact, sometimes being highly intelligent makes you believe that you can. Yeah, yeah, you don't need to have the same elitism. Yeah. yeah, or you know better than people, or you know I'm so smart that I can get away with whatever, or you're narcissistic because of it, and so it actually may fuel yeah. lack of integrity. And we see that some of the some of the people that rip. People I wonder off the if most I wonder if that's more common than not. I wonder if it's more common when you get to the, like that level of an IQ that because you're that way, you're more tempted to manipulate and to yeah. take advantage of others. Therefore, there's a higher I percentage like of I think, they're easier. They get more frustrated with people, you know, because like they uh, they they assume everybody's going to understand on their level, and then it's like they have their communication skills are probably well, not as intelligence is actually correlated with mental dysfunction lots of different mental issues uh, it's actually strongly correlated and it's we're not quite sure why i mean it's correlated with depression anxiety uh, schizophrenia um and other types of learning uh you know challenges or whatever like um, dyslexia and all that stuff and they they think it might be if you're considered intelligent right it means that you're you're smarter than the average person because humans are intelligent species but if you're an intelligent human compared to your, your peers, you prob- your brain probably processes a little differently or you think a little differently, which increases the likelihood that you may have dysfunction as well. You know what I'm saying? So, so there's, there's, there's always that kind of stuff. It's kind of, mm-hmm. kind of weird. Dude, I was reading this article on, this is an article that was just published uh, today, and it says, how the secret to a longer life is at your feet. They're actually starting to write articles about how important Foot strength is for longevity. Mm. You know, it's it's funny how far we made it into fitness and and not like really paying any attention to that. Looking back now, the the amount of knowledge that we've accumulated just in the last three and a half, four years and hanging out with Brink and really putting uh, a lot of focus and emphasis on my feet. Mm -hmm. And it's it's crazy now, if I meet somebody and I'm assessing them or I'm helping them out with anything mechanically with them, they they have any aches, pains, Mm -hmm. anything at all, any part of their body. The very first place now that I address is your foot, like yep. I was looking at your feet, and I can't believe that that was something that I was missing for yeah. so many years because nobody ever really talked about that. Well, so there was a there was a study in 2009, so it was not that long ago. I mean, sure, it's a, it's a little while ago, maybe nine years ago, but that's still not that long ago that was published in the Journal of Clinical Biomechanics that showed that the weaker certain foot muscles were the more likely people were to have a, a fall mm-hmm. and to have injury. And then in, in 2015, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, they started referring to the foot core. So we know of the core muscles of the midsection, but they also talk about the core muscles of the foot, which are, if you, if you think of the foot, if you were to look at a foot and, con- and imagine it to be like, a, like your torso, mm. right. the muscles in the middle of the foot that connect the front and the back and help it communicate and stay stable. Basically how you can do like short foot and do that whole- Yeah, that is arching. the core. Right. So and it's no, if you're weak, if your foot core is weak, it's not that different than having a core that's weak in your midsection, in which sense you're going to increase your risk foot of- foot crunches, bro. Yeah, <laughs> increase your risk of injury. Yeah. And when your foot is, because that's the first thing to contact the floor, when that is dysfunctional- the dysfunction travels up the kinetic chain because something has to make up for right. that dysfunction. Well, it's amazing when you look at the way the evolution of shoes, like, you know, before we walked around barefoot everywhere, right? And then eventually we we moved to these, you know, pieces of leather, you know, with some hay in them, like wrapped around your feet. And that was like the the, the extent of cushion. You're still pretty much walking on the, on yeah. the ground. It was basically there just to protect from any sharp objects or anything that could probably cut you to like, you know, these super cushioned soft soles to now women in high six inch mm. high heels all the time yeah it's one of the most dysfunctional things we that people do to themselves is wear heels mm. oh, by yeah. far oh exp- even the heels you have on right now adam no even, i know because yeah. these are just running shoes right but if you look at them your foot is at a slope right and even that is is creating a pattern especially if you walk around them all day i'd say easily easily by far the most dysfunctional thing in modern humans is our feet because yeah. that's the first thing that we cover and first, cast right it's the, it's the contact point you know yeah. to all movement really i mean mm-hmm. like you, all the gravitational forces everything it, it all you know stems around what the feet like how they handle that well think of the also the brain like you know they show that when we exercise and move that the brain lights up we in, we increase bdnf which is this 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 uh, you know brain derived neurotropic factor that in, increases 
growth of new neurons and nerve cells and all that stuff. And the and all these connections are made because your brain needs these connections to move your body in space, improve proprioception, and to process sensation, right? Well, the bottom of your foot is super highly concentrated with uh, nerve endings. Mm-hmm. It's, the most in the body, right? Yeah, um, m- Maybe that's, that's why I'm so ticklish. like the hands, right? Yeah, like the hands. I, I yeah. believe the I believe the feet are the most. It might be. It might be, or it's like the hands, right? Mm-hmm. Because because maybe maybe less than the hands, because the hands are required to. We use our hands so much in tool making and stuff. Yeah, but we have more we have more bones in our feet than we have in our hands. Yeah, right? yeah. So, but there's a ton, right? There's yeah. I mean, nonetheless, there's a ton of nerve endings, and from the day you can walk until you die, you're almost always covering your foot with something, not developing the the brain neural pathways that are required to process that sensory, Mm -hmm. which is why most people, modern people, if you take our shoes off and we walk on, like just on gravel, which is not going to cut your feet. It's like, ah, uh, uh, you know, it's like sensory overload. It'd be no different than living in a dark room and then going out in in the sunlight. You can't, you can't process it all. Well, and and I think the part that I, I can't believe how long I neglected it as a personal trainer is to realize how much of people's knee pain, hip pain, yeah. shoulder pain, back how pain that affects your whole is, kinetic chain. Yeah, is it's all stemming from the foot. I mean, if you have just the slightest bit of any sort of pronation or inversion or eversion going on in your foot, just the slightest yeah, bit, you just walk up, you see compensation. Yeah, it, it pings back and forth up your up your body all the way up the kinetic chain, like Justin was saying, and. I, not very many people know to even think of that. Like you have knee pain, you you think you have bad knees, right? That's what every client thinks. They go, oh, my knees are really achy and right, bad. It's right, like right, I have right. bad knees. Like, no, you don't have bad knees. What you have is you have some dysfunction. More than likely, the dysfunction is stemming from the foot and it's, and That's it's right. That's causing right. the it's pain. It's no different knee. than like if you have a car and you look at the tires and there's like a lot of wear on one side of the tires. Mm-hmm. You don't have a tire problem. You have something else that's causing it's an alignment your, issue. It might be an alignment issue. It might right. be your shocks. It might be something like that, right? Yeah. So it's no different than that. So it's really not a, a knee issue. Yeah, your knee hurts, but there's something else that's causing that dysfunction. And, and you we can tend see to forget that with like bunions, and you can see that with calluses mm-hmm. and, and the way that you know you you apply pressure. If like I'm always putting pressure on my pinky toe or I'm always putting pressure on my big toe, it's like you can. You can just just take a second and look at that. Do you know how many people see that? You know how many people's feet will have like their pinky toe doesn't even touch the floor. Yeah, that's actually quite common. Well, they relax and their foot's relaxed, and the pinky doesn't even touch the floor. Oh yeah, I mean that's just that is supposed to touch the floor. Yeah. But it doesn't because your yeah, feet are, 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 are all, all toes. Toes are smashed together so yeah. much that one's oh, laid over dude. the top of them. Like that. Have you ever looked at pictures of LeBron James' feet? Yeah, some of those guys. <laughs> yeah, we pulled them up here. That is some. Yeah. That is some crazy. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Especially yeah. those guys with big feet. And that's ah. the thing too is people see these athletes and they think oh, they're a super athlete, so they're they're okay. But that's why there's so much dysfunction even in them. That's why most of them end up with so much back pain and all kinds of issues later on in their life is mm-hmm. because. They've learned to compensate with that for so many years, but they've never really addressed yeah, any yeah. of it. Something else, too, I wanted to talk about, and I don't think we talked about this on the podcast. I think I might have brought it up off air, so stop me if I have, but I was reading this this study on uh, multiple personality disorder, and it blew me away. So you guys familiar with that with that psychiatric disorder and what that is? Do you guys I'm know what that is? Not familiar as like I, I've had a client. You've heard of people, it. Yeah, but I know. Yeah, like yeah, you could change your personality on, on a whim. Yeah, so essentially it usually comes from severe trauma and we're not quite sure how it happens, but we think what people what happens in the psyche of someone is they create separate identities within themselves to handle different situations. So like someone was, let's say, severely abused, they may create an alter mm-hmm. you know, personality or identity who is there for the abuse so they can step out and not not attend it or whatever, right? So there's lots of theories as to why it happens, but it's a it's a real identifiable psychiatric condition. And they're actual identities. Like literally somebody, a man, a grown man can have an identity that's a five-year-old girl or that is a woman or that is whatever. And they believe it and they act it out and that's who they is are. Is it predominantly a protective mechanism? Like That's the what they part? say. That's yeah. what they think. And uh, sometimes they're aware of the other identities. So they know like, oh, you know, John did this yesterday or whatever. And sometimes they're not aware. There's actually been cases where people have this multiple personality disorder where they don't even know. They just, they don't know that another side of them came out, Mm -hmm. which is even harder to deal with. But anyway, it's always, it's always been like kind of controversial. Is this like a real identity? Do they really believe this? What's going on? And since we've, you know, invented, uh, fMRI machines, which are MRI machines can image blood patterns in the brain 
and can do it in real time. So we can see what parts of the brain are lighting up when we play a particular song, when you have a particular thought, whatever, and we can see where you know what's going on. And it's in real time. And so what they did is they took this, they took these people who had multiple personality disorder, put them in this fMRI machine, and watched what happened when they would switch identities. Well, there was this woman who had two identities. She had like several identities. It was like 10 identities, I think. Two of which, and this has been observed in other people as well, two of which these identities were blind. So she could see. She had functioning what? eyes and everything. Oh, wow. But two of the identities, she would go into this identity and she couldn't see. She was blind. The FR- fMRI machine captured what was going on with her brain when she would switch into this blind identity. Hmm. The part of the brain that processes vision off, turned Just off. Shut it off. Completely turned off. Wow. So she was See, essentially what's fascinating blind. to me is that we have the ability to, to potentially yes. do that. That's what's you fascinating to me. That. That's, that's exactly what's blowing me away because she believed so wholeheartedly that she was blind in this identity or this identity was blind that literally the part of her brain that processes sight was turned off so she was effectively blind. Wow. I mean, think of the what applications- of that to you know everything you know everything we do because we try so hard to separate the the subjective from the objective the 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 mental and the psychological from the physical mm-hmm. but you can't it's all totally connected yeah. and and it's all influences one influences the other I mean you could have a physical issue you think in our lifetime we're going to learn to tap into these things do you think we're going to what where well, we're at right now in science do you think we're going to have the ability to either one supplement or use a tool or a machine to train ourselves to be able to tap into this i i think it is the ultimate that is the ultimate uh horizon that is the ultimate place to to explore with the human psyche because if we can do that then we can cure pretty much any issue i mean think about yeah. it if, if we could figure that out we could cure alcoholism addiction we could cure bad habits you could literally go in there and be like look i need to change my viewpoint on this situation in life or I need to become more conscientious because I'm lazy mm. or I need to learn how to save more money or whatever and you could go through therapy and and really figure this it, out. Wow. I mean, it reminds me a lot of the work that I saw, you know, with Wim Hof and being able to tap into the autonomic system as far as like, you know, muscles that just are involuntary. But, you know, you can actually like through meditative practices and breathing and, you know, like cold immersion and all these things, you can actually start to tap into really being able to like control like, your adjust, temperature. Yeah, your temperature, your, what is heart, your heart beats, everything. Doug, would you look this up? Because I know I, I know I've heard the number before and I don't want to mess it up. I know monks, I know they have the ability to- Some cha- Tibetan monks. Yeah, yes, yeah. have the ability to change their core temperature at will up to like t- seven or 10 degrees or they, something like that. They've actually done yep. where they'll go out into the snow and they'll mm. meditate and mm-hmm. they'll put wet towels on their body in the snow. Yeah. And they'll meditate, elevate their body temperature so much they dry the towels. 17 degrees. Yeah, 17 degrees. Dude, that is a lot. Yeah. 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 Think about that. If you're in a, in a place that's, you know- 20, 30 degrees freezing cold and to be able to jump up 17 degrees is mm-hmm. nuts to me. Mm-hmm. Their skin yeah. temperature, 17 degrees, which is massive. 17 well, degrees well, is just huge. a lot of room to learn more about our body and our mind and our psyche, especially. Yeah, that's, well, that's fascinating. Here's, what I, here's the thing, too, because human, you can generally say that humans learn in two different ways. One is the one that all of us, most of us learn through, which is a slow gradual process, right? I learn little by little by little, and it takes me years and years and years of practice and awareness to make these big fundamental changes to where you get a Tibetan monk who's been meditating for 30 years, and it's a drastic change, but within that 30-year period, it was small, incremental, non-perceptible changes, right? It just took a long time. But then there's another way that humans learn which you could call epiphanies, for example, or there's an actual Western medicine term for it, and I can't remember what it is, where something happens and boom, we're different. But that usually happens from a, a dramatic, maybe trauma or event that happened right at, you know, that, that really shifted your, your way of thinking. For right. example, you could have someone who's an alcoholic and let's say they go out in their car one day drunk and then they hit a kid and kill a kid. That could be enough to create that epiphany where they change forever, right? Mm-hmm. I think we're starting to tap into that with, with psilocybin, psychedelic mm-hmm. uh, medicines. Uh, and I'm I'm not basing this off of personal experience. I'm basing this. Off, it's not just my opinion. I'm basing this off of the science that's coming out 
because like the science that they came out with with PTSD where PTSD could take decades to get people to kind of mm-hmm. come out of it and some of the science with like where they're doing psilocybin treatment treatment or MDMA treatment it's like two two therapy sessions and they're cured and they'll come test them a year or two years later well this is this is also how i yeah. i interpret the the bible verse where they talk about you you if you have as much faith as a mustard seed you could move, move mountains, mountains. Yeah. And so I, I really believe that it, that's the first feat is for us to even believe that, to have enough faith and belief that we can do these types of things with our brain and our mind. And if we tr- the problem is that we just don't think we can. Mm-hmm. And if you have it's literally like the Matrix, like Neo, remember when he had to jump off the building, but he had to believe that he could. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's, right. it's, it's literally like that. And it's, it's really weird. The more we start to, to do this, dive deeper into this science. It's crazy. Like that like the study I bring up all the time where they did the fake knee surgery and they're like, Oh, my knee feels better. But they didn't yeah. even do anything. Yeah. They didn't even cut people open and they had like dramatic results. It's Tr- it's crazy. I- equivalent to the actual knee surgery. <laughs> yeah, like they yeah. compared it to people who got knee surgery and they had yeah, the same that doesn't prove your mind is powerful. Like I, I can't like pinpoint anything else. Well, perception is obviously everything, but I think it might even go beyond that. I mean, think about it. Like if your body was really under your control, could you technically tell your cells to like kill a cancer tumor or heal your heart or you know grow back a limb i mean i don't know i mean this all sounds crazy but well what what bacteria is it that that um uh that people will eat and then they'll get really sick right like salmonella salmonella so they injected salmonella in in a few of the wim hof um like practitioners i'll try to remember reading and he's actually they've proven scientifically that by um you know tapping into you know the breathing autonomic system they're able to like manipulate their immune system to fight and battle it and then came out uh, Scot free, whereas you know somebody didn't apply these practices, got really really sick. Yeah, I I, I do I, I really do think that that psychedelics may just from the science that I've seen, and I don't mean you take this and then you get you know you figure it out for yourself. I think they're powerful tools. I think you do the opposite too. You could use them and then come out way worse. But I think the 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 way we're studying them, they may hold some of the keys to to that kind of treatment because. They work on that on that level, on that psychological level, to the point where, I mean, I was watching this. I was watching a documentary on this, and this this is like this a woman who, whose best friend died from, uh, you know, it was a terminal disease, and she was just absolutely, completely devastated. Could not go to work, whatever. Did therapy, didn't work. Then she found this this licensed therapist who also on the side did. Uh, treatments with MDMA, kind of, you know, obviously black market, but did it because she found it so so successful. Went and had a treatment, and the, after the, they interviewed the woman afterwards, and she's like, "I f- I feel completely different." She's like, "I I am not being able to reach this point at all with anything else I've ever done." She's like, "I feel like I'm cured right. after one treatment." Mm. You know, well, it like, might be enough just to. Well, yeah, it's why hypnosis works for some people. Yeah, you know, some yeah. people swear by it. Like I swear, I could not quit smoking for the life of me. I was hypnotized, and then I. Well, know. so from a physical sta- basis, I don't. I got to find this this article because I, I think I sent it to you, Justin. They actually show physically where the brain under the influence of some of these psychedelics actually restructures itself physically. Mm. They can actually see neurons changing, connecting, and making different connections. To permanently or just to change itself from what a depressed brain looks like to brain that's not depressed. Mm -hmm. They can actually create new pathways, actually restructure itself, you know, or become more plastic in the sense where it starts to restructure itself. So I think that we may start to tap into some of this stuff uh, in the, in the future, or, or at least it's going to revolutionize how effective therapy can be. That's, that's my, that's it'll my be interesting. Theory. I know you're, you, you're on that wagon. I don't know if I'm, I'm all the way there yet. If yeah. I believe that that's going to, if we're going to, I just wonder, I know that as humans, we tend to fuck everything good up. You know what I'm saying? We take something that <laughs> yeah, we take, we take true. something that's some, that's good, good, give it information, good research, good science. And then we end it, we end up bastardizing it for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. There's the article. Psychedelics could help treat depression by physically restructuring the brain wow. restructuring. I mean, you know, here's a deal. Look, if you believe in a higher power or you believe that, that, you know, that we're not alone or whatever, it's not hard to think that certain things were placed on earth for a particular purpose. I mean, right. every effective medicine, medicine and plant. Yeah. yeah. I mean, 
we, we, I mean, it's, we found we're lots just of misusing them. We're partying with them, you know. Right, and that's what I mean by medicine. man. Man yeah. ends up screwing it all up, right? I mean, it was probably it was potentially put yeah. There name for thing him. with name one thing with a lot of power that doesn't have massive potential for abuse. Right, you can't. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory-tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk-free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. All right, our first question is from PD Pitbull Fitness Diving Life. That's a, that's an Instagram <laughs> okay, handle right there. Short name, short name. You know how mad are you at your friends that do that, that have like a long ass name? I'm like, <laughs> you know why I don't follow you, bro? Because I can't remember your freaking yeah, Instagram yeah. handles. Way too many words. Can we just keep it at PD? Yeah. <laughs> As a trainer, it can sometimes be tough to practice what you preach. What are your tips for holding yourself accountable and living by what you teach? Mm. Mm. Get some judgmental friends. Thank you. Yeah. I was just, I was just gonna say that. That's, I was literally just gonna say that. Uh, yes. You're, if you think that you by yourself are aware enough to check yourself, you are fooled. You are a fool because oh, yeah. your ego, you fool yourself, all your the time. your ego is so insidious and so clever. It is literally how you identify. With this yourself. is why the, I mean the five people you surround yourself with are so important. Not just on like a financial level, but things like this. Yeah, this is where it starts to bleed over. And if you are always hanging out with people that just don't value health and fitness, you're going to end up doing the things they like to do, which is drinking, smoking, and doing things that are not serving their body and taking care of themselves. So even if you are this fitness guru, if you're constantly hanging around them all the time, it's going to be really tough for you to do that. I mean, you've yeah. got to be a rock star to be able yeah, to do that. The way that. I look at it is, is I, I, number one, surround yourself with people who actually, uh, who actually want to see you do well or do better right they have your interest in mind but they're also not going to bs you no you know? right you don't want to surround yourself with people who don't and how do you know that well if something bad happens to you they're upset and if something good happens to you they're very happy for you like genuinely so now you know that they're they have good intentions uh also make sure that they're relatively intelligent and that you respect them and then when they tell you something that, about you that you're doing wrong uh believe them mm -hmm. that, that's a tough one because you you want to defend yourself right away right. But you know, if if, if yeah, because it stings. It you does know, sometimes, especially yeah, yeah. When you're like, oh, there's some truth in that, like, but you want to deny it, you know, and you want to keep going about your ways that you've been going. But yeah, you need you need to really <laughs> be open to that and yeah. be open to the criticism. I think this happens a lot with couples too, where you're you're dating someone you really respect and care about, and then they come to you honestly, and they're like, hey, you're acting like a jerk right now, or you know, you're being a little lazy right now, and you want to defend yourself, you want to fight. Like sometimes just stop and you know you feel the urge to defend yourself like kind of hold it a little bit and say okay maybe they're right maybe maybe i need to take what they're taking seriously well, this is a this is a really tough thing for a lot of people to deal with i, I mean i've shared on the show many times this transition of you know the people that maybe you you grew up around and that were good friends for whatever reason maybe there was something when you were in high school that bonded you guys together and so you're really tight but as you grow and you get older and you evolve and your values and your morals and your beliefs start to change and really form who you are, you have to always be reevaluating your circle and your network of people that you're hanging out with because they are your direct influence. What's that stupid saying? That birds of a feather flock together or whatever, yeah, maybe, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, I mean, if, you, if you're somebody who really value and that's another thing too you got to gut check yourself and ask yourself do you really value this do do you really care about health and fitness that much that it's that important to you if it is then you do want to be surrounding yourself with people that that are doing that and they're not gonna, and I know Justin came out with the fine judgmental friends but if you have friends that value health and fitness it won't need it won't need to be a judging thing it won't be a like oh you're doing this and I'm not and I'm doing that it's that they're going to be doing things of interest that are, are similar because they have similar values and morals so I think that is something that you have to really dig deep in is one ask yourself you need to first check yourself on your own personal values yeah well like you're aspiring to be like these people around you you right. know, like I see what they're like if they're living their life a certain way, like it, whether it's health and fitness related, you know, spiritually, whatever it is, these things that you can pull from. Like I want to surround myself with people that are better than me uh, that I see. Like I see deficiencies in, in, in how I am. And so these people just being around them. But that's not what's normal. What's normal is we're drawn to our insecurities. Yeah. What's normal yeah, is that we want confirmation 
so that we don't have to change. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we want to be the best in the group. Exactly. We want to be that. We want to be the healthy one in the group because then when we go decide to go eat shitty food and do things that's not healthy for our body, I still feel better because you know what? My four other friends, yeah, yeah. they're way out of shape. I did they that would, for a while. I live with some fat guys. I, I mean, I think everybody does. I think it's. I think it's very natural. You're the lean guy. <laughs> it was. It was nice. It was nice. You know, I was. I was prime meat back then. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true though. We we tend to gravitate toward that, and that again, that's our in securities that's yeah. us wanting to feel better about ourselves because it's an area that we need to work on and we don't want to address it therefore we hand we surround ourselves with people that we're better than in that area instead of stretching our capacity and surrounding ourselves with people that maybe are excelling in these areas in our life that we want to be better I, at know, i take it even a step further because again if you have people around you that you respect and value and they know that they they value and respect you and that they want what's best for you it's still hard. Sometimes you'll do some things to yourself that are that are self sabotaging. Self sabotaging, not beneficial. You know, let's say you smoke too much, or let's say you're you know you're you're not eating healthy, or let's say you're you're treating your spouse a certain way, or something that you objectively, if you had to be totally honest, you know, like that's probably not the best. But you lie to yourself because that's what we do, and we do a very effective job of it, of it. And your friend comes to you and says, "Hey, man, you know the way you're you're treating your spouse, or the way you're eating, or whatever." It's not good, man. It's not good for you. Your 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 uh, instinct is to defend yourself, but knowing that this is a person you respect. Like, look, look my co-host. We'll talk about Adam, Justin, and we'll talk about Doug, the producer. I respect these guys. I respect them tremendously, very, very much. I respect them so much that they could come say something to me that about me that I know I'll try to defend, but afterwards I'll think to myself and be like, would you know Justin say something like that just to? just to say it, or is he the kind of person I respect that would only say it because he meant it and he was being honest? Well, I know objectively he is an honest person, so I'm going to believe what he's saying. I'm going to start to try to believe what he's saying. And I don't mean you just listen to what people say to you. You have to be very careful with who you surround yourself with and whose advice you take, because you also don't want to be a, a follower and do what everybody tells you all the time. But I tell you something right now, the worst shit you do in your life is the shit that you lie to yourself about. It's never the stuff you're aware of. Or you're fully aware of, because otherwise you wouldn't be. The doing only it. reason why I'm weary about that advice is because a lot of people don't realize the people that they're with are unhealthy for them, and so a lot of times these people that are around them, the advice that they're giving is a reflection of their insecurities. For example, Justin points something out at you because he's insecure about it. You know, you know, Sal, when we showed up to that place, you know, I felt like you were totally, you know, ignoring me, yeah. and you know, what I'm saying uh, he's giving you, and that's really his insecurity because he can't be by himself. Typical. You know, <laughs> Like, you know what I'm saying? Like that would obviously that would not happen with this the me, relation, yeah, yeah. relationship that we have. But a lot of times the people that you're surrounding yourself with, you're unaware of how just just how unhealthy the relationship is. And then you're giving advice that, OK, if they they then provide you with feedback on you, really, that's a reflection of their insecurity because you're surrounding yourself with the wrong people. That's so. right. That's yeah, that's step number one. Like, again, do these people that you surround yourself with really want like imagine if you went to the people like imagine if you you went to the group of people around you and you said to them my business exploded yesterday and I'm a millionaire would these people be jealous would they be happy for you genuinely would they be would they want something from you what if you went to some of these people and you said something wrong happened something bad happened to you would they care to help would they care that you were upset to try and help you or would they kind of be happy i mean i've had people around me in the past where if i failed at a business venture I could almost sense that they, not necessarily happy, but just that it, it, it confirmed in them that, oh, taking risks like that, it's kind of bad. So versus people who may be like, oh man, that's terrible. Like, let me see how I can help you out. Like you have to find those kind of people around you and then be able to respect what they say to you. And that's, I think that's you, such I, a- I think you have, to you have to define your values first. You have to define what are your core values and what, what really matter matters to you. And then you have to look for people- that exemplify those areas of, of your values. So for example, I'll use you two as an example for me, right? So at one point I will be a father, right? And so I really, I look at you guys and I go like, I love talking to you guys. I love when you express and share stories about that because I, I think the way you handle your parenting is incredible. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but you're far better than I am at that. And I and I look up to you in that area. That's important to me. And that's because that's an important value that I know that'll be very important to me when I raise my child. And so 
I, I want to surround myself with other men that take a lot of pride in being a great father. And that doesn't, t- and now if you guys weren't great fathers, it wouldn't take from other, other attributes that you guys are also excelling at, but that's an important value of mine that I have to find in mm-hmm. somebody else. And I have, I have found that within you. So I think it's important that you first define the things that are extremely important to you, and then you surround yourself with others that exemplify mm-hmm. that in one way or another. And, and each friend may, may have something different. Like, so you know, maybe you're somebody who is, has a spiritual background. And so I want somebody that excels in that. So I get that. I, you feel, you fuel that fire for me. And then maybe Justin has got this, he's super business savvy on a whole nother level that I can totally learn from him. And so he fuels that fire for me. And so there doesn't need to be any of this communication of you need to do this or finger pointing or judging stuff. You're finding mentors. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're finding mentors within your own circle in areas that you, that are important in your life. But most people are not doing that. Instead, they're surrounding themselves with people that represent the other side of you, the side that isn't, that's unhealthy, that's lazy, or that makes bad decisions, that makes you feel good because, you know what, oh, they're they're doing worse than I am in that area, so at least I'm okay. Yeah. It's something that subconsciously happens yeah, to a lot of people. Way less challenging. Right. Well, it, if we, we, it's comfortable to surround yourself with people that keep you help you not grow or at least make it comfortable to not grow you know what i mean like if you're just a degenerate and you have a bunch of degenerate friends it's going to make it comfortable more comfortable for you to be a degenerate well imagine if you were a degenerate but all your friends were conscientious hardworking, intelligent people yeah it's going to be a little uncomfortable yeah. it may force you to have to try to grow it will force growth right right if you if, if you, you try to stick around right right if you're the degenerate and you're surrounded by four people that are not like you will level up to them if you're, it's the other way around if you're the stud in the group if you're the one that is grounded really well and then you're with four degenerates you'll come down to their level mm-hmm. and you'll never grow they'll, mm-hmm. they'll, it's like uh you know john c maxwell talks about this in the leadership laws you know, if you're a, if it's a scale of one to 10, 10 being you're a great leader, one, you're terrible. If you're a seven on the leadership scale, you will never surpass that without hanging around eights and nines and tens. If you are constantly hanging around sixes and fives, as far as their leadership the abilities, you'll never be, get beyond that. You'll be stuck at that level. And that's what happens. It's to like with anything. Yeah. It's like with sports or it's like jujitsu. Like if you, if you're a, a purple belt level, you ain't going to get to black belt unless you roll with black belts. You just roll a bunch of blue belts who are worse than you. You'll never really get that much better. You have to hang around with people who can push you to grow. Which when you make these points, this is what's really tough for all of us is to be okay. My mom says this a lot. We'll plug her since she's here right now. Is that the seasons of your life, being being comfortable and okay with these seasons of your lives and knowing that. And this was tough for me for a very long time with certain friends. You know, I would create these bonds with people that provided a certain value in my life. And and a lot of times what would happen is I would outgrow them. I would outgrow them and it was time for me to move beyond or move into another season of my life. But I was stuck in that season. I want to stay in summer. I don't want winter to come up because winter means I got to change. It means I got to grow. It's going to be uncomfortable. And so this happens to people as they they meet their network of people. Mm -hmm. They become attached to that. They stay in that season forever and they don't learn to evolve. You know, that's a common uh, common thing these days with uh, with men, they call it Peter Pan syndrome, where guys mm-hmm. don't want to, uh, they don't want to get responsible. I love that you just used the Peter Pan thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah why? a little subtle jab right oh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but you know, it's been it's been talked about quite yeah. a bit recently because Dude, even Doctor Molly brought up yeah. they, all these guys in Silicon Valley that live like in house and they just you know every like nobody well, wants to. It's 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 men in their typically in their thirties who want to stay young they want to be they right. they don't want to grow it's up the they don't want to claim responsibility they don't want to get married they don't want to have kids they don't want to you know uh make investments that we're, are going to ground them they just want to be a young kid and just do want to be a pirate yeah and yeah. it's because they have they don't they, search for gold yeah they don't have Chasing the pleasure the, bi- the, the yeah. biological clock yeah. that doesn't that doesn't go Indeed. off on them like it does on women so you see this more common in men and uh you know again you, how do you hold yourself accountable i mean you know it's a great way to hold yourself accountable and this isn't for everybody, obviously, but for me, I can see it's podcasting. Are you kidding me? When I listen to episodes and hear how I talk and my opinions, I can be objective and hear what I'm saying and be like, oh, shit, I sound like an asshole right there. Oh, that's yeah. a good point or that's a bad point. And it really changes how I start to think about certain things because oh, it's a recording. feedback from other yeah. people. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> on on uh, you know, social media. Yeah, so yeah. it's crazy. Next up is a fit story. You guys have talked about increasing calories to rev up your metabolism, but a lot of people have a real fear of consuming more calories. How would you recommend helping people overcome this fear? You know, this is something that um, 
poor Jessica, man. I just keep I keep bringing her up a lot. I just a lot of the questions you guys are asking lately is uh, relates to. This is why I still do a little online coaching because it's it's good to be able to work with people. It is. It gives and it gives me a place that I can reference for this perspective to give you guys exactly. kind of an, an analogy of what, what's what she's going through right now. And you know when she first came over here uh, for help. You know, she's competed. She's been in great shape. She's been as low as 125, 130 pounds, and she's now walking around at 168. And she comes to me like, Adam, I'm the worst shape I've ever been in my life. you got to help me get rid of this. And when I evaluate her metabolism. So what I do always is I track and see where she's eating, how she's moving. And so that's about a week or two of me kind of calibrating where she's currently at. And what happened was I realized, holy shit, this girl is... 168 pounds. She's 13. She's 1300 to 1500 calories. Anything over that, she gains weight. So she eats 1600 calories and she puts body fat on. Like, what a frustrating position to be in, especially for a 170 pound female. And then to top it off, then you you pay a guy like me money, and then I turn around and say, Hey, uh, I'm gonna have you eat more eat more calories. We'll probably gain some weight. And she looks at you kind of sideways and goes like, No, I hired you to lose weight. Mm -hmm. This is not what I want to do. Now, luckily, I have a, a long-term relationship with with her. She knows me, and she and she trusts me. So we're on like, and I think we're up to eight eight weeks now. And I've been slowly increasing her calories, and we are up. I've, I've pushed as high as she's been up to 171 pounds. So in seven weeks of training consistently, being strict on a diet, tracking everything for me, I'm inching her calories up now. I know because I've been here many times with clients on how challenging this is mentally, especially for my female clients to be able to do this. This is less hard for my men, extremely difficult for, for women. It reminds me of when a guy comes and wants to build muscle and you're like, we're going to have to work on mobility for four months. So you're not going to gain strength and gain muscle <laughs> right, right. in four months. It's <laughs> right. similar, right? Right. So the first thing you need to be okay with and understand that this, this is a process. You didn't get in this situation overnight or even in four weeks, or even in eight weeks, or even in 12 weeks. This has been years probably probably of you yo-yo dieting and not eating correctly. So have a little patience and understand that we have to reverse out of this. So, And try and focus on something besides the damn scale and the way your but, pants and shit is fitting you. That's the key that's right it. there. That's so the big thing that I do. Strength is what I drive home. So I strength, how you feel in your workouts, and, and trying to connect those dots. So you know, for us, it, and it's been great. And she's made this mental switch and it happened about three weeks in where I said, I don't want you really getting on the scale. If I do, I want it for me. And it's only so I can kind of calibrate where you're going. I'm not concerned about weight whatsoever, but I am concerned about you feeling stronger and you feeling fed. I want you fed. I don't want you go. I don't want you hungry right now, but I want us to make good nutritional choices when you are hungry and feeding you correctly, making sure your micro and macro nutrients are balanced. And so I'm leading that. And then I want to inch up your calories. And while we're doing that, all we're looking at as your gauge is your strength changes. Like how much is your deadlift coming up? How much is your squat coming up? How much is your overhead? And because she has seen these these great gains in strength. It's now happening, now eight weeks in, she's starting to feel it on her body. She's like, you know, it's so weird out. I'm like, my pants are fitting me worse than they've ever fit me. I feel like I need to wear sweats. But when I touch my body and when I look at myself naked, the shape of my body looks fine. I look better than what mm -hmm. I, I should for where I'm at weight. And when I grab and I touch my muscles, they're they're hard and they're denser. And even the way my butt is sitting, it's not sagging. It feels like it's, even though I have fat on it and I'm not happy where my weight is, the way it's sitting on my body feels different. I said, that's because we're building muscle. Yep, yep. And I asked her this. She's 30 something years old. I go, have you ever started a workout regimen and a plan and not also cut calories or tighten up your diet? Never in her life. Yeah. Most, Never. most people. Most, most people, women, when yep. they decide they're going to go on their kick to get in shape, they start their cut. they start exercise and they cut calories. They go to burn as many Worst calories you as possible. Yeah. And eat. Worst thing you yeah. could do. Well, I get yeah. why this question keeps popping up. I and mean, we've visited this specific topic probably the last like couple of weeks. And it's because it's such a hard conversation to have mm -hmm. with somebody coming in, and especially as a trainer and trying to, you know, get them to buy into that concept. It's it's such a foreign animal, you know, for a client because they all they see is I want weight to to, to disappear. I want my clothes to fit better. I want all these tangible changes to happen, but you know, to to get them to understand they need to build 
and to to then you know really you know reframe that whole thought process is you have to it's a monster it's like a mechanic if it's like someone brings their car into me you gotta build trust it's like someone brings their race car into me and they go Adam, we got you. Got to fix me. My cars. I'm losing races. I'm not winning anymore. And I go, okay. Well, let me get under the hood. And I pop underneath the hood. And I go, oh shit. No yeah. wonder this thing isn't running fucking right. I mean, your timing belt is off. You got no yeah. oil on this. Your pistons yeah. are all rusted. You're your, leaking coolant. Your tires yeah. are bald. Your alignment is off. All these things are screwed up inside inside of you. Nothing that has anything to do with the speed yet of the car, but it does have something to do with the speed. You know, I could just tell you to floor it as hard as you possibly can to try and get there, but everything starts to fall apart that way. Now, if we take the time, we fix all these pieces inside of you mm. then what happens it's effortless give you a big block motor oh mm-hmm. right it's it's effortless when you when you when you address all the things that are, that are broken down with your metabolism and i think you just got to one you got to be patient with it two you change your focus it's no longer about the scale and the weight it's about building strength and building muscle because the more strength the more muscle you have the healthier of a metabolism. And there's a range have. too. There's a range within your current amount of muscle mass in terms of how many calories your body will burn on a daily basis. In other words, you don't have to gain a shit ton of muscle. And I want to say this because I know there's women listening who are like, I don't want to gain 20 pounds of muscle yeah. to get my metabolism to speed up you know, by 1,000 calories. You don't have to. It may show up as like a few pounds on the scale. But within that range, there's actually a big amount of calories that your body can either burn more or burn less of. In other words, you can even stay the same weight, same lean body mass, and get your metabolism to ramp Which up this is or the, slow down. This is the goal. That's pretty much the goal. Is this the, is the goal. Right? That's what I try and do. To, and because I also want to keep her sane while she's going through this process. Like I could care less if she goes up to one seventy five or one eighty because I know what I'm doing. I know I'm going to come back the other direction, and we're we're. But I know too for her sanity, but psychologically. Yeah, yeah. psychologically, I, my the, the where the real, real work comes in for me is being able to watch it and give her just the right amount of extra calories and increase her intensity so that she doesn't see much movement up or down on the scale. But then when I go retest her body fat in a yeah. month, there's a 4% reduction in body fat. And a lot of people don't understand how to compute that and what happens. And what has happened is there's a perfect exchange. It means that over four weeks, our scale has stayed the same, but she has lost four pounds of fat and she's added four pounds of muscle and so her body composition has changed her metabolism has changed but her scale has stayed the same yeah yeah, yeah. and you know give people different metrics you know you have to give people different metrics to to keep track of because the weight loss one is not the one that we're going to be looking at right now if all you focus on is weight loss it's not you're going to have a very tough time trying to amp up your metabolism because that's not going to happen for a little while so start to give people other metrics they can measure. Performance is a great one, like Adam said. Strength. But I like to ask people about their energy, their sleep, their mood, their skin, their mobility, their endurance, their, their stamina. Poops. All, all that stuff. Yeah. And I, I, I'll ask them all these questions. When I coach people, we'll talk about these. And I'll even tell them sometimes. I'll say, look, for the next three months, you're not going to step on a scale. I don't want you to weigh yourself at all. Sometimes, if they have a real problem. Sometimes I'll have them weigh themselves, and we'll do it once a week, just so I can monitor what's going on. But the main focus is on other metrics. No. How, how are your deadlifts feeling? Oh, you're stronger. That's excellent. How is your sleep? Oh, it's better. That's fantastic. Is your libido healthier? That's fantastic. That's great. How's your joints? How's your body feeling? Because people want to, it's natural, right? They want to feel like they're progressing at something. And so if you get them to focus on, and I experienced this myself. When I first started training in jujitsu, I my focus had always been on how big and strong I was that when I did jujitsu, I had to focus on how well I did the techniques and how well I moved. And it actually helped me break free from the whole, you know, insecurity about my body being a particular well, size because now I'm focusing on something else. Well, look at what, look what yeah. I just went through. Everybody knows that's been listening to this show for a long time, like what I've gone through hormonally, how much my body has changed completely. Imagine being a guy who's 230 pounds jacked to the gill, gills and then coming all the way down to 208, 210 pounds. The psychological piece has been the most challenging piece of all of that. And so what I've had to do to, is not get, not identify with this meat wagon, to get, identify with this muscle building guy. It's to focus on other parts and other areas that I can improve on. And, you know, my mobility, I just hit huge. That was such a big deal for me the other day with being able to do an overhead squat like that. 
I've never been able to do that. That's such a huge victory for me. And then at the same time, to be able to objectively look at myself and go like, I'm also nowhere near in the best physical shape I've ever been in my life. Nowhere near it. But that's okay because I'm getting wins in other places. Mm -hmm. So like you said, Sal, I think learning to look at libido, look at sleep, look at mood, look at energy, look at all those things, those other those other aspects of your life and try and target those to improve upon. I think those, those are Excellent. a great idea. Next question is from Mary Beth Brown 5. My mom is 60 and has been diagnosed with osteopenia. She recently hired a trainer and has been lifting weights and working out consistently. Last time she was at the doctor, the nurse instructed her that she shouldn't be lifting weights and should only be walking. Can weightlifting build bone density in someone over 60 with pre-osteoporosis? If so, how should they be structuring their program? So I, I can't, gotta love doctors I can't like nurses like this. Yeah, I cannot express how irritated I am over yeah. this, over that, that dumbass nurse. Yeah. So here's the deal. I'll say this 100% right now. Mark it down. It's all recorded and out. Resistance training will be the number one form of exercise that will be recommended for all aging people in the yeah, near future. Super crucial. Period. Because resistance training combats all the issues that happen with aging directly and better than any other form of exercise, right. including and especially bone density. Uh, but, yeah. you know, that's a ridiculous one. If you have, so osteo, osteopenia is before you get osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. Nothing will make your bones want to strengthen and grow. And training. And like, a little resistance. Like adding sheer force on your bones, which is exactly what resistance training does. Now, walking can build some bone density in your lower body. It's off gravitational force. And that, that's just off because of the impact. Yeah. But sheer force, sheer force does it better. And sheer force is when you're taking a bone mm. and you're applying force on it like you're trying to bend it or compress it mm -hmm. and with resistance. And that's literally what resistance training does. And I like to use this kind of an example for people because people think, oh, take more calcium, use this drug, whatever. If your body has the signal to adapt by becoming stronger, that is the only time all these additional things that you take and do will actually benefit you. It's like adding protein to your diet without lifting weights. You're not yeah. going to build more muscle just because you have more protein. Or it's like giving, it's like having a bunch of bricks in a yard but having no build, builders to build your house. Throw as many bricks as you want. No mortar. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not going to be turned into a house until you have the, the workers. And the stimulus that causes that is... Resistance training. I had a client who, years ago, where she came to me because she had osteopenia, but she also had another condition where her body wasn't producing enough uh, red blood cells. In fact, they thought she had cancer at one point, but they found that she didn't, but it just kept getting worse and worse. So her doctor said, hey, you know, you should start exercising. She, she came and saw me and we started working out. She was on she had been on the like, uh, was it called um, the immune immunomodulating or drugs or immunosuppressive drugs for osteo osteopenia? They weren't really doing anything for her. Mm -hmm. She was doing you know the cal whatever all this stuff wasn't doing anything for her. She started resistance training with me, and within I think it was a six month period for the first time saw reversal in her osteopenia, and we got so good, things looked so good that they actually created a case study around her because of the effects. Which to me is silly. Like, duh. Right. Of course, resistance training is going to do that. Th let me explain it's why. It's really sad that we're still dealing with this. It's. it's I mean, stupid. this is this. The science has been around for this for a long time now, and the fact that we still have they don't they don't get educated in this, dude. They no. have no all they're educated I on know, is activity. But it, it's such a simple fix, like to change that. And like, and I I one hundred percent agree with you. And I would bet all the money I had. Uh, al alongside you that this will get changed as a recommendation because it's purely just uh, the lack of education and the what it would take to actually just change it. I, I don't know if there's all these hoops they have to jump through in order yeah. to to change that. It's just a lot of red tape. That we get so protective, you know, in the way that we prescribe things and like we don't want people to, you know, do anything that's going to cause them to accelerate their harm when in fact... You know, the, 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 the training of it and the actual exercises is what's going to get you building up to where you get stronger and you can resist forces where we're afraid of the forces now. Avoid the forces. Like, right. don't 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 go out and lift anything heavy anymore. A, a medical doctor has no business talking to you about this. A physical therapist, you want a DPT, you can yeah. go something like that. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that would be ideal. They'll tell you that. And they'll tell you that resistance training, absolutely, they would encourage for you to do it. Of course. But again, it's a it's a risk thing, right? So they think that like, oh, you, they've been told like- Well, it's because, you know, the problem yeah, it's with risk it- risk management. The problem with, with it is this. Conduct a study on cardiovascular activity. Easy. 
Everybody go 30 minutes uh, for a walk and we'll study this. Conduct a study on resistance training. There's a so, million and yeah. one different ways to apply resistance training. Yeah. And some of them are, are effective and some of them are terrible. I could see a study coming out saying resistance training has no positive effects on health. Right. And it's not because resistance training doesn't work. It's because when you look at the routine that they used, it was some bullshit circuit or something like that where they weren't applying it properly. The problem is resistance training requires more programming. Yeah. It requires more expert programming. Whereas and understanding the skill of it as well. That's it. Like too much intensity, too little intensity, right amount of frequency, the right bi biomechanics exercise. It costs way more money to conduct a study on it than it does to conduct a study on cardiovascular training. But if you look at aging, what happens to your body's your age? Uh, hormone levels start to change. Mm -hmm. What form of exercise promotes youthful levels of hormones better than any other form of exercise? Just, Resistance yeah, training. Uh, mobility. As you age, you lose mobility where you feel stiff, you can't squat, you can't uh, bend over, you can't reach up above your head. What form of exercise directly combats that and improves it better than any other form of exercise? Resistance training. Uh, let's look at strength, muscle, uh, the loss of muscle mass, and metabolism adaptations where your metabolism slows down. What directly combats that? Resistance training. There is no form of exercise that can literally compete with resistance training when it comes to this. And this was my specialty. I trained people for years who were in advanced age, people over the age of 65. And the reason why I became a specialist in this, besides the fact that I enjoyed working with them, is I started training one. Then I started training two, and then I started training doctors. Then doctors started training, sending me all their older clients because the results they saw were, I'll tell you something right now. If I get a 25 or 35-year-old client and I train them, I'll see dramatic results. Mm -hmm. You give me a 75-year-old and I'll change their fucking life. Right. Yeah. I'll change their life completely right. to the point where they were maybe dependent on someone and now they're independent all of a sudden. Life-changing. That's how big of a difference well, resistance mean, training makes. Cardiovascular training, I mean, what's the, the, the greatest benefit to that? What, like heart and lung health? Sure. Right? But at the same time, you could still get a heart pumping effect, you know, from resistance training, the, the, just like you would running. But it's, I mean, obviously it's a different process, but at the same time, like there's like all those benefits you, you listed, I mean, far, far outweigh, you know, what, what cardiovascular training provides, but that's, it's because of, I think it's, it's the skill acquisition, yep. right? So it's, this is something that we need to take seriously as like, if we're going to bind together as, as professionals in medical, in the medical field, in, you know, health and fitness, like we all need to kind of like get better at now. Okay. If, if I have a, a patient that's dealing with this and I want them to do resistance training, we need to we need to give them somebody that knows what they're doing to teach them the skill set. That's right. And, you know, you said physical therapists, Adam. Physical therapists are very good at correctional exercise. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to progressive resistance and, resist and training, yeah. they're terrible. I know this. And that's not their training, right? They, their training is not to do that, which is why they don't know it, which is also why I've had a lot of clients that were physical therapists. It's understanding that progressive resistance, understanding how to apply exercise programming. But, look, here, here's how resistance training – Think about it this way. Nobody's going to argue that resistance training doesn't build muscle. We know that. But muscle anchors to what? Bone. Bone. If your muscles are going to get stronger, that is going to send a signal to strengthen bone as well. Connective tissue and bone because it all has to anchor. Oh, they all affect each other. That's right. And this is one of those things like going through Dr. Spina's course, like they went into great depth as to, you know, all the different layers of tissue and it's all goes down through the bone. Everything gets affected by, you know, how it reacts to this like external force. So oh, what, what an incredible protocol together. right there for somebody or, uh, you know, modality that I would recommend to somebody who's 60 is like, and getting them started is Ken stretch. Mm -hmm. You know, getting them into an, an active stretch like that, uh, man, just that starting them there and then progressing them to movements they can't do. Because I think what happens with someone like this is the fear of injury. I mean, I think that you, especially if you're somebody who waited until you're 60 years old until something like this happens, because that's typically what happens to someone like this is, you know, as, as Americans, it's very typical. We wait until it's broken before we decide to even apply anything towards it or try to fix it. Is it, it so this person's probably been trucking along for 60 years of their life with no real resistance training or incorporating that at all. Mm -hmm. And now they're trying, and then they got a, a son or a daughter who's trying to encourage them, mom, dad, you got to lift weights, you got to exercise. And they're probably scared to death. And they right away ask their doctor, doctor tells them that. So that's their easy out. It's like yes. doctor goes, oh no, don't do that. Stay away from weights that could hurt you. Well, just take 
calcium supplements. You're right. If my my 60 year old mother gets under a, a squat rack and she starts trying to squat 225 the first time ever, yeah, she probably, probably will break her back, yeah. and it's probably not a good idea. Mm-hmm. But getting her first to understand her imbalances, the areas that she's probably disconnected from because she hasn't moved a certain way for. I mean, just imagine. Uh, Progressing, progressing the sixty-year-old to a point where she can get into a ninety-ninety position, mm-hmm. like get, uh, the, the, it, her internal and external rotation of her hips, like that right there would be a huge feat just to get her to start to do that, and then being able to get her to drop into depth, like and actually move her body weight down into a full squat, and then eventually progressing to where you actually build some strength and add. I some would resistance. love to see a study on like strong hips and, and the longevity that provides, you know, as far as lifespan of somebody, you know, versus somebody with like a weaker, you know, hip and like bone density. Yep, yep. People just don't realize that if we stop using things, it, it just goes away. The, the brain prioritizes Like if you no longer take your, your body and you never ever take your scapula and retract, squeeze and depress, which is a normal basic row exercise that we teach to everybody and really important in combating forward and rounded shoulders, right? So if you don't ever do this anymore, your brain just says, stops the communication. Yep, that's it. It Forget says, about it. yeah, no, no reason to do it anymore. And so if the brain stops the communication to all those muscles that keep you back in that good posture, then what has to carry the, the stress? Now mm-hmm. all your spine and your and all your, your bone structure carries the stress. And then all of a sudden you don't, you don't feed it nutritionally, you don't exercise it, move it, then you start to get things like this where you get degenerative type things that's going right. on with your body. And then, look, here's the thing. like You'll find, sometimes you'll find people who are very uh, active cardiovascularly who run a lot and the bone density that gets affected most is, is in their legs but you'll, you'll sometimes see in their upper body well, they'll have signs of uh, mm-hmm. osteopenia. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, again, I, I know I, I'm going to keep making this case. Resistance training, one of the beauties about resistance training, one of the challenges with the resistance training is also one of the beauties of it. The challenge is Require, it's much more complex, requires much more programming. But one of the beauties of it is extremely, it's, you can individualize resistance training with no other form of exercise, and you can train the entire body and the movement patterns. There is no specific movement pattern in resistance training. In other words, if I'm walking or riding a bike or swimming, there is a standard pattern that I have to do over and over to do those movements. Resistance training, it's like, it's wide open. I can move in any way that I want as long as I have good control and good form, which means if I have an imbalance or I have pain or this is where my bones are weak, I can train a particular way to directly affect that particular area. If I'm if my only form of exercise is walking and I'm getting osteopenia in my neck or my spine or my upper back, the walking isn't going to make that big of a difference. I may get some carryover, but it's not going to make that big of a difference. Versus resistance training, I can specifically target the muscles of my upper back and the stability of my upper back where it attaches to the bones that are being affected and directly affect those particular bones. Because although there is systemic bone loss that occurs, there's also uh, more uh, specific bone loss that occurs um, in parts of your body. And if you don't believe me, take your arm, put it in a cast, don't move it at all, leave it like that for a couple of years, and then look at your bone density in that arm. And you'll find that that one arm will get affected and, this is and the great, rest of your body won't. This is a great where we talk, you know, if, if you own Prime and Prime Pro, you've you've heard of or seen our fortification sessions. And this is how I would apply this to somebody like this. Like that, if if your mom or it's her mom, right? It's somebody's mom is right. I think so. But yeah, if this is if your mom does not have or you don't have Prime Pro and Prime, like what a great place to start because Prime, there, you, there's an assessment tool that goes in there. So she's going to have to do an assessment. From that assessment, it will point her in the direction of what exercises are good for her. And then she can start to make a, her workout completely around that. Like before you even start getting into any major movements like mm-hmm. a squat or a deadlift or something that probably seems very scary or intimidating for her, or she may not even be in a position to where she can do that yet. So doing like the fortification sessions, doing the prime pro movements to make sure she has good joint health and good mobility with her joints, and then eventually progressing her well, to a program. I mean, yeah, if you're already if she's suffering from osteopenia and she's 60, I'm gonna just go ahead and say just do the all do the all three zone fortification sessions in prime. You probably don't even need to take assessment. Just do the fortification sessions right. and assume that you're she probably has issues in all of those zones. Next question is from T Myers 100. Do you think implementing mini cuts into a bulk can be useful? 100%. Yep. This, same, same exact reason why putting a mini 
bulk within a long cut is beneficial because the metabolism adapts. We've been talking a lot about speeding up the metabolism and how it's a good idea to speed up your metabolism for most people. But there are situations where where you've constantly been trying to gain and gain and gain and your metabolism is adapted and adapted and adapted to the point where just to gain another pound of muscle, it's like you got to consume 5,000 calories a day, which I've been in that situation it's a pain in the ass. It's very difficult. Yeah, you're not assimilating the food like you know you were initially, you're, right? You're just burning you're just overwhelming it. everything, and you're burning it, and and consuming that much food and not being efficient with it might not be a good thing. So doing a mini cut in the middle of your bulk can actually resensitize your body to these calories and proteins, make your body a little bit more efficient, so that you gain more weight or more muscle mass with less calories and. What's his name? Ben Pakolsky made an fa- right. amazing point a while ago. We were on his podcast, and I was making a comment about how pro bodybuilders have these phenomenal genetics, and one of the things about their genes is their, ab- their ability to consume mass amounts of food right. to support their mass, and he corrected me. He said, no. He goes, you don't want to be a pro bodybuilder having consumed 10,000 calories a day to be 300 pounds of muscle. You want to be able to have the kind of metabolism where you can consume 3,000 calories a day mm-hmm. and still look muscular like that. And we actually experienced that. I actually witnessed that myself when we went on. We, we actually took a trip with uh, Robert Oberst, who's a world's strongest man competitor, and he <laughs> eats about the same as we do. Yeah, he's a massive yeah. human being, by the way. He, I mean, you know, he, he picked up Adam like he was a baby, held him in his arms like a child. Oh yeah. Through you know, just in the pool, threw me on the head like I was like, yeah, I was like five years old. He's a big, big human being, and he probably ate 500 more calories a day than than I did, and he outweighs me by over 100 pounds. Yeah, because his body so does such a good job of assimilating that food. So yeah, mini cuts within a mini bulk, you'll build more muscle. If you do that, I, this is how I like to intermittently use fasting too. It's a great way to do that because you, we, we always talk about the health benefits of including uh, fasting every now and then. And what an easy way for you to to start off a little mini cut is so I'll, I'll be trucking along four or five weeks of doing some sort of a bulk and then I'll do a fast and then a calorie reduction for three to five days and then go right back into my bulk. It's a great way to kind of shock the system and then turn right back around into your bulk. And I think it, everyone's there's going to be an individual variant. So like you're not going to get like a specific protocol from me as far as, you know, oh, do this many days or do it for this long or reduce your calories by this. Because if you're someone like me who spent the first 30 years of his life always in a bulk, there was huge benefits to me actually running a cut like like for an extended period of time because I'd never done that yeah, before. Yeah, mini cut would have not been long enough. Right, yeah, yeah. exactly. And so, some, and, but maybe somebody is, this person is really good about doing that. So everyone's going to have a little bit of an individual variance, but I think there's great value in actually getting out of that surplus, especially if you're running in a surplus for weeks on end. I mean, if you're running it for a few days or a week or two, not a big deal. But if you're somebody who's been bulking for weeks or like what a lot of these bodybuilders do where they bulk for a whole season or perma bulk guys you yeah see these guys in the gym yeah yeah where they're like three months they're like on a bulk, bulk like 100 percent throwing a short even like a short week like it doesn't need to be like an extended period of time if your primary goal is to bulk and put size on i'm not telling you to reduce calories for months on end but if you've been on a bulk for a month or two straight throwing a nice solid week of actually a mm-hmm. calorie restriction oh man watch how your body responds yeah. when you go back to refeed i like to tell people who are trying to bulk to if they're doing a long bulk just do one, do a fast once a week. Go do a 24-hour fast once a week where one day a week you only eat one meal and then go back to your regular bulk and watch how much more effective those calories are when you are eating the extra calories. Plus, it gives your body a break. One of the problems with being on a constant bulk, that's a lot of work for your digestive system. That's a lot of potential for inflammation. And that fast that you do once a week gives your digestion a break and allows you to assimilate more of that Do you food. find the uh, ghrelin response to be tough when you're in a bulk and then you have that mini cut and then you go right back to bulk? Like that's got to be pretty pretty tough to go through that like day, right? Cutting as opposed to like cuz you're in that momentum. Of, I of I eating. like I like it because one of the problems is challenging. One of the problems with being on a bulk a lot or for a long period of time is the fact that you lose your appetite. You mm-hmm. actually do. Like you start to find at first when you bulk you're like, "Oh, this is fun. I get to eat all this food." But then after you do it for a while, especially if you have a fast metabolism or you're an ectomorph, it's like you got to stuff yourself with food all the time. And it's a fucking job, man. And it sucks. No joke. Fast once a week and your appetite comes back the next day. All of a sudden you start eating again and you want to eat more. Mm, I remember Mm. experiencing that. It Mm. was a, I mean, talk about how big of a pain in the ass it is to try and 
stuff your face with food. Yeah, uh, yeah. that could be a, a major chore. challenge. Well, yeah. and that and then to me that should be your natural signal that you're you're pushing the body yes. beyond where it wants to be. So it's it's an it's an and that's maybe that's a better answer than us telling you like oh do a fast for this long or do this many days or like that. Well, you know, do your bulk and as long as you are enjoying the increase of calories, you don't feel like it's a struggle to get those calories. But you know, there's will come a point where you feel like oh I'm just stuffing my face and when that that's probably your body's natural system telling you like hey. That's more than more food than I want yeah, to even. Break. Yeah. So how about go back the other direction for a little bit and then reset and come the other way? Excellent. Look, uh, we have free guides, free, absolutely free, available at mindpumpfree.com. We have guides on how to do HIT training properly, train your legs, how to tone up your arms or strengthen your arms, your midsection, your chest, your calves, and more. Just go to mindpumpfree.com. Download them now. They cost nothing. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.